These blasphemous texts are the Necronomicon. It was written by the mad Arab al-Hazrat himself and was found in the possession of a desert-dwelling Sufi tribe in Upper Egypt. It contains forbidden knowledge and unholy incantations. You have been warned. What may be safely told of the Old Ones? In the sacred text, titled Bereshit, signifying the beginning of things in the tongue of the Jews, we are taught that the Holy One created the world in six days, and on the seventh rested from his travail. Before he began, there was nothing, and when he completed his work, all that we know was perfected. All stars of the heavens, all forms of plant and beast, all seas and mountains and plains. And that most noble pattern, Adam, the first man, more beautiful than the angels since his face mirrors the face of God. Our race was formed at the end of the sixth day, the final thing made by the Creator to be the Lord and ruler of every lesser creature and of the spaces of this world. So it is written. And men who are devout believers accept it as the sacred word of God. But a few among our race who are discontent to receive teachings as an infant receives its milk, but must restlessly seek them out where they lie hidden, know that in the spaces between the days other creatures were made by other makers, and since they were made at night, they have remained unseen and veiled in shadow. Neither may it be presumed that our race is the most ancient or last of the masters who rule this world, or that the aggregation of living forms known to man walks unaccompanied. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. They walk not on the places we know but between them, tranquil and primal, by us unseen, for they are formless. Yogsothoth remembers the gate. Yogsothoth is the gate. Yogsothoth is the key and protector of the gate. What was, and is, and shall be, are one in Yogsothoth. He remembers where once the old ones broke through the vault that separates our sphere from the outer darkness, and where they shall break through again. He remembers where they left the imprint of their feet in the mud of the earth, and those places where they still walk to and fro, and why no one can behold them as they pass. By their odour can men sometimes know their presence, but of their semblance no man can know. But only indirectly by peering into the lineaments and expressions of those they mingled with mankind. And of those there are many types varying in appearance from the mirror of man to the shadow outline of that. Invisible and formless presence that made them. They walk unseen and reeking in desert places where the words have been intoned and the rites howled through at their proper times. The wind gibbers with their voices and the earth rumbles with their thoughts. They bend the trees and crush the cities, yet neither forest nor city beholds the hand that strikes. Kadath in the cold waste knows them, yet what man may truly boast that he knows Kadath? The ice wilderness that lies far to the south, and the isles drowned beneath the sea's bare stones upon which their seal is cut. But who among common men has seen the frozen city or the sealed tower, garlanded for ages with seaweed and encrusted by barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their kin, yet he can discern them only dimly. Iya, Shabnigarath. As a foulness shall you know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet you see them not, and their dwelling place is even one with your guarded threshold. Yogsothoth is the key to the gate wherein the spheres meet. Mankind rules where they ruled once. They shall rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer. They wait, patient and potent, for here shall they rule again. At their return all men shall bow their heads and serve them as lords. Those few who remember their ancient presence with invocations and offerings, given at their places of power, shall command the mass of our race who bleat as sheep and low as cattle when they are led to the slaughter, for we are as food to them and as beasts of burden that toil in the fields. The prayers of the prophets shall not prevail against them, neither crescent nor cross nor star can forestall their approach, when once again the heavens align and the gate is opened. Eya. Nyalat Hotep. They shall visit us in darkness, but by their fires the night will be made flashing with the brightness of polished brass set against the face of the sun. Seven are the lords of the old ones. 
six who are as brothers and sisters, and a seventh who is to them as the son of a father's brother, and who stands apart although he is one with them. The names of others of their race are whispered in the deep caverns, but the others have not the same family blood, and these seven are the leaders or heralds in our world. Among the seven are those better known and those obscure, for not all the old ones interest themselves equally in the affairs of this world. Their names are Azathoth, Dargan, Nialathotep, Yig, Shubnigarath, Yogsorhoth, and the seventh who stands apart, Cthulhu. Within the room of seven soul portals, in the nameless subterranean city of the reptilian race, are cut in rock the seven seals of the lords, each above one of the gates. Though it is not always apparent what connection the lands beyond these portals bear the old ones, murals in other chambers and passageways tell of their forms and natures, so that by a careful study of these images they may be known in part, and only in part, for no man has ever comprehended all their ways or their purposes upon the earth. The Magi who dwell in the Valley of the Tigris allotted to these lords of the Old Ones the spheres of the wandering bodies of the heavens, not because they dwell in the planetary spheres, nor yet because the planets have power over them, but for the reason that the rays of the planets are in a certain accord with the potencies of the lords, under the heads of the planets, as under titles of authority, shall they be severally examined herein. Cthulhu Corresponding with the Sphere of Mars Great Cthulhu is ever a warrior god, and of all the old ones he is the most terrible, for it is his delight to slay and lay waste to everything that lies beneath his feet, and the very lust to conquer what was once free drives him onward across the heavens and through the spheres. It was he together with his star spawn that defeated the elder things, who had long possessed the sovereignty of this world before he descended on his grey and leathern wings through the upper gate, opened by Yogsothoth. As hungry wolves on an unguarded flock, they fell and crushed the great stones of the barrier walls of the elder cities into sand. Even the Shoggoths were driven as chaff in the wind before their fury. Who can measure the strength of a Shoggoth? Yet it is whispered by ancient things that dwell in the depths that its strength was without avail against the might of this god. Into the sea the elder ones fled little dreaming that through the changes of fortune and the passage of ages they would once again walk the frozen stones of their greatest city far to the south, and Cthulhu would lie trapped beneath the waves in the sea. Long eons the old ones reigned in our world after the vanquishing of the elder race, their palaces and cities secure under the protection of Cthulhu and his armies. No foe could defeat him, save only time itself, for the heavens revolve unceasingly in their courses and care nothing for the will of men or gods. The stars became poisonous to the old ones in our world, and so they withdrew in bitter rage to bide their purpose until the sky was once more wholesome. Yet Cthulhu would not depart from the lands he had. Conquered, he devised a work of potent magic that would keep him safe within the house he had made for himself on the mountain that overshadowed his island city of Relia. Within a tomb protected by great seals he lay as in death. Yet he dreamed, and in his dreams continued to rule the world, for his thoughts mastered the wills of all lesser creatures. How could he have foreseen the cataclysm of the lower earth that drew Relia beneath the waves? The waters of the deeps were the one barrier his great mind could not pierce, and it was for this reason that the Elder Ones had sought refuge beneath the waves so many ages before, to escape from his tyranny. The barrier that protected the Elder Ones while Thulu raged above has guarded humanity from his fury throughout the history of our race, for he has never ceased to hurl his commands forth from his mighty mind all the span of his durance beneath the surface. The stars do not always remain poisonous, but for brief periods in their endless turnings they assume the angles of the same rays they shed down in the primordial dawn of the world. Then does really here rise upward, so that the house of Cthulhu emerges into the air. The mind of the god waxes strong, and he uses its power to send forth to men who are susceptible to his influence the command that they release the seals that bind his tomb. For it is his single weakness that he cannot release himself from sleep, but must rely upon hands of flesh to shatter the seals. As though in bitter jest, the stars never remain right for more than a handful of days, and always in the past. 
before the men enslaved by the god can reach distant Ri Li. Their fatal conflux of lights permits Ri Liya to sink once more, severing the bond between the will of Cthulhu and the flesh of those he has enthralled, leaving them to wail in confusion and despair upon the bosom of the vacant sea. On the walls of lost cities and in the carvings of madmen who have glimpsed him in their dreams is the form of the god delineated. His height is as great as a mountain, and he walks on taloned feet that resemble those of a hawk, so that the very stones of the earth are shattered by each step. Yet from his back extend vast wings that have no feathers, but are made of skin, as are the wings of a bat. And with his wings he flies between the stars. His body has the shape of a man in that he has two arms and two legs, but his head cannot be described without horror, for it is akin to the formless mass of a deep dweller having many ropes or soft branches that hang and writhe in place of a face, and his crown throbs and moves with watery softness for he has no skull. His eyes are small, and three in number on each side of his head. The color of his skin is green mingled with gray on his limbs and trunk, but paler gray on his wings, and these he is accustomed to keep folded so that they hang down to the ground behind his heels and tower above his pulsating crown. Such is the unnatural body of this god, which has no kinship with the dust of our world. Indeed, it is not flesh as we know flesh, but as crystal or glass, and soft, so that during his dreaming death it often breaks apart, but when it breaks it at once reforms itself, held in its pattern by the will of the Great One. This truth the elder race, who are indeed of solid albeit strange flesh, learned to their dismay as their murals in the City of Heights on their own world attest. For no sooner did they shatter the body of Cthulhu with their arts of war, than it reconstituted itself, and in moments was whole. He is as their own Shoggoths, about which men whisper but which no man has seen, able to take the shape of his desire, and to hold it. His spawn are like himself, but smaller in their dimensions, what they lack of their master in size, they compensate with their numbers, for they fly into battle, as the locust swarm descends upon the ripening field of grain, so thick that they obscure the sun with their wings. At times past the Migo have followed his commands and battled in his wars, for they dread the influence of Cthulhu upon the whim of their god of passage, Yog sothoth and risk any danger rather than court his displeasure. All this was in the ancient times, and in the age of man Cthulhu lies dreaming in Rilia, his spawn has vanished, and the Migo are a return to Yogoth, all but a few that watch and wait. The tale is whispered that at some future time the stars will move in their courses and align as they have in the past, but at last their pattern will endure, and the world will become wholesome for the old ones. Cthulhu will rise and conquer, as is his right, for what force of gods or men can stand against his fury. Until that day, may it soon be witnessed, those wise in necromancy who adore him wear the seal of the god burned upon their skin and chant a litany in his remembrance, in the tongue of the old ones. The dreaming Cthulhu teaches his prophets in their sleep. The prayer has this meaning in our tongue. At his house in Rilia, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. It is so. In the far places of the world, from the plateau of Leng to the western isle of Albion, to the banks of the Nile and the frozen wastes of Hyperborea, is chosen chant these words, and they are the sign by which they know each other, and the bond that unites them even when they are of different races. The poet may sing a different song, for they chant what has been and what remains, but the poet intimates in verse what shall come to pass, that is not dead, which can eternal lie and with strange eons death may die. Of all the lords of the old ones, Cthulhu stands alone and apart, for he is not of the same blood with the others, though his blood mingles with theirs. They use him as a sword, and think to distance themselves from his presence when the battle has been won, but he keeps his own counsel well guarded, and none can say what he intends for his kin. When all had fled the poison from the stars, he remained in his house at Rilia, and dreamed his deep purposes in solitude. The ocean alone contains him, for the stars cannot shackle his mind, 
It was because Kulu is the greatest of warriors that the Magi who are descended from the royal line of Babylon link him with the sphere of Mars, god of war, and none are wiser in the lore of the heavens than the priests of the Tigris. As Mars is the conqueror of all who oppose his will, so too is the dreaming god. As fire, the element loving to Mars, hates the water. So does Cthulhu hate the weight of the ocean above his head that frustrates his purpose. The Magi gives to him the number square of Mars, having five rows and five columns, each with a sum of sixty-five, and the sum of this square as a whole is three hundred and twenty-five. They teach that the seal of his name traced upon the square and incised into a plate of iron has power to give victory in battle and protects the warrior from injury by sword or arrow, and that its sight is pleasant to the things that dwell in darkness and are loyal to Cthulhu, who spare the lives of those who bear it. But this last is a lie. yog -Sothoth, Corresponding with the Sphere of Jupiter the race of Yogoth, who came to our world in the distant beginning of time before the making of man, fought the Elder Ones, and drove them deep into the south where lies frozen the land of perpetual ice. The race of Yogoth gives the greatest honor apart from their moon to Yogsototh, whose existence is in unending harmony with all dimensions and all continuance. The creatures of Yogoth call him in their own tongue of flashing colored lights, him who lies beyond, or the transcendent Lord. The remaining Migo in our world, residing in the highlands of the east, continue to serve him and act as his agents and messengers. Only Yogsatoth has the power to open the way between their colony on Yogoth, beneath the sphere of the fixed stars, and their distant homeland, beyond the changeable star known as Thar al dabal Akbar, the back of the greater bear. He guards the heavenly gates jealously, even as he creates and destroys them from moment to moment with his dancing colors. Truly did the sage Ibn Shakabau write that the face of Yog sothoth is the face of the heavens itself. He and the vastness of space are the same, and the turning, interlocked circles of the spheres are the orderly progression of his thoughts, some moving fast and others slowly, even as they turn the bands of the astrolabe to mark the motions of the wandering stars. He is seen only by his face, body he has none for his body is the universe, yet not the very matter of creation, but the measurements of angles and distances between. He is composed of no tangible thing, and can only be perceived as a shimmering array of ever-changing colors, such as may be seen on the shell of a beetle, or the wing of a dragonfly beneath the sun. He is known by the cults of men, that adore his gates as the all-in-one, who is one in all. They worship him within stone circles composed of great monoliths, and the chief of these is on the grassy plains of Albion. Though its builders have been forgotten, its function is unimpeded. From it open outward gateways to all reaches of this cosmos and countless lesser gates. It is the great mother of doors, and yog -Sothoth holds the key. These gates he cannot open wantonly, but only when the stars align and the angles come right for passage. A gate is opened when he appears, and his face of flashing colored spheres all overlapping and turning one within another at varying rates, is the gate, the key, and the way. Those who pass through become for a timeless aeon yog sothoth knowing all things that were, that are, and shall be. But having transited the gate, they forget everything, save only for a lingering sadness and sense of regret that cannot be set into words. And so profound and enduring is this sorrow that many are those who find life unbearable after opening the face of the transcendent, all, while there are men who have dared to seek glimpses beyond the threshold and to accept him as a herald, they would have been more prudent to have shunned commerce with him, for as Ibn Shakabar relates, it is written in the Book of Thoth how fatal is the payment for but one glimpse of his face. Neither is it permitted that those who pass through the higher gates ever return, for in the empty spaces transcending our world are patterns of shadow that grasp and bind. The thing that stumbles by night, the wickedness that defies even the Elder Seal, the throng that gather watchfully at the secret portal possessed by each tomb and make themselves fat on what grows out of the corpse within. All these abominations are less than he who guards the gateways. He who will guide the rash traveler that speaks the words rightly 
beyond all the spheres and into the void of unnameable hungers, for he is called Tawil, al Umma, the first ancient one, which the scribe has rendered imperfectly in our tongue as the prolonged of life. When the road of the moon and the road of the sun cross in the heavens, then Yogsototh is exalted and empowered to open the spaces between the stars, and greater still is his power when the sun and moon copulate, and the gateways spawned are his children, for he is sun and moon united in lust. The sweat of the sun falls, but the dew of the moon rises to maintain his balance of turning circles. This is the invocation cried out in the tongue of the old ones that calls him at these pregnant times within the circles of stone, having met all requirements of worship and sacrifice. Ngai, Ngaga, Bugspogog, Yiba, Yogsothoth, Yogsothoth, Ayi, Yiha, Bugspogog, Ongbaba, Ongaye. The charm to open the gate is to be inscribed with the seal of the Capit Draconis and may be voiced following the preliminary summons on either day of the month. For both head and tail of the dragon are times when the heavens are in balance, so that on these days the way may be opened or closed, and the charm of opening is this. Yainganga, Yogsothoth Hailegeb, Fai Thredog you are. The charm to be inscribed and cried out with the seal of Cauda Draconis for the sealing of the gate that was opened by Yogsothoth is the same but turned against the course of the sun. Even as the first charm follows his golden chariot, the charm of closing is this. Ogbrod Aif Gebali Yogsothoth Hinga Aishra. In this way are unlocked the gateways of the soul and also of the flesh, but after another manner. Soul can carry flesh with it, either upward or downward, either into the light or into the shadow. Yet flesh has no will to bear the soul where the soul refuses to travel, and if the gateways of flesh are opened without the willing concord of the mind, the body becomes hollow and a vessel for demons, and the soul a wraith howling in the wind, in invocation of the first ancient one, or when summoned before him by his power. The supplicant demonstrates his fidelity to the god by falling to his knees and placing his palms over his eyes with the fingers up, then rhythmically bowing at the waist until his head touches the ground, as though in silent lamentation. This he does nine times, having a care to the number, for if the obeisance is given incorrectly, or the number is more or less, the god will blast to glowing cinders the body of his careless worshipper. The searchers of the heavens who dwell in the valley of the Tigris have joined Yogsothoth with the sphere of Jupiter, for the reason that mighty Jove is the father of lesser gods. He rules their comings and goings, and holds the keys to the gates of Olympus. To journey all must seek his sufferance, and all owe him the tax that is levied at the entrance of the city from travellers seeking to pass either two or four. They held the belief that the seal of this god formed upon the square of numbers sacred to the sphere of Jupiter, having four rows and four columns, each of which sums thirty-four and sixteen cells over all, the sum of which is a hundred and thirty-six. When inscribed on a square of tin, it would avert the wrath of Yogsothoth and afford good luck and protection to the traveller on his road. To this belief, the wise may ascribe little value. For many are the stragglers after the caravans who wear this square about their necks, and their bones lie white on the sands where the carrion hawks have scattered them. Azathoth Corresponding with the Sphere of Soul There is a cause why the flute plays such a prominent role in the cults that worship the old ones in the dark places and hidden caves, away from the ears of common men. At the seething and fiery centre of all, Azathoth sits upon his ebon throne within his halls of darkness, that no man has seen and survived the vision. He is both blind and bereft of mind, but unceasingly he pipes upon his reed flute, and the purling notes that rise and fall in measured patterns are the foundation of all the worlds. These notes are more than music, they are numbers. Azathoth ever calculates in sound the structure of space and time. Were his flute to suddenly fall silent, all the spheres would shatter into one another, 
and the myriads of worlds would be unmade, and as they were before the creation. There is a mystery known to few, that his flute is cracked, and can give no pure sound. It is explained by sages, that when he blew the first great note, that began the outpouring of worlds, the force of the sound was so vast, that no instrument could endure it, not even the flute that made it. But this is the reasoning of children, and the truth is elsewhere, for the crack in the flute is a way of expressing the imperfection inherent in all created things. All that is made is imperfect, for perfection can have no form or texture in the mind. Azathoth himself is imperfect, being blind and blubbering as he pipes. Yet how can the Creator who was never made be himself imperfect? Consider this riddle and be wise. Only the breath that bears the sound ever outward in widening circles, unseen and formless, is perfect, for the sound is but a pattern pressed upon the breath, but the breath pervades all. If it did not, how would the sound be carried to the farthest reaches of space? It is not the breath we know, but the subtle essence of breath that can neither be seen nor felt, and is forever unknowable. The flute of Azathoth both makes and unmakes the worlds in ceaseless combinations that are like dancers spinning on the woven carpet of time. There can be no creation without destruction, and no destruction without creation. To unmake a thing is to make something else, and each time a thing is made, something is destroyed. The idiot god on his black throne does not choose what shall rise into being, or what should pass away, but only maintains a balance and constant order in the number and pitch of his notes. These piping sounds are numbers, for they interact in ratio and proportion. All things are made of numbers. Men are formed in their flesh by the arithmetic of Azathoth, who gathers his sums and brings forth shapes. No created being has seen Azathoth, save only Nyarlathotep, who is called the chaos that creeps by writers who fear even to voice his name. In Azathoth is order, in Nyarlathotep is disorder. They are half-brothers, and can never be separated, for even when far apart in space, Azathoth forever creates the patterns and Nyalat Hotep forever disperses them. It was the blind idiot god who piped forth the universe, but it is whispered that it shall be the crawling chaos who on the last day of time shall snatch the flute from his blubbering lips and break it, ending all forevermore. Nyalat Hotep looks upon his half-brother with contempt, yet knows full well that he is as dependent on the song of the flute as all other things. This enrages him, so that he waits in eagerness for the last day. Concerning the face of Azathoth no pen has written, unless the writer lied. For no living creature can look upon it, and endure its terrible heat and black radiance that is like the reverberating unseen rays of heated iron that strike and prickle the skin, or crisp and sizzle it when too near. Only Nyarlathotep, who has no face of his own, has gazed into the countenance of the idiot god, and even he is dazzled by its fires, and must turn away after an instant. Azathoth receives no supplicants in his black halls of uncouth angles and strange doors, nor does he ever hear prayers or answer them. Endlessly he pipes, and endlessly he devours his own substance, for his hunger is insatiable. Nothing is taken into his body from beyond and nothing is expelled, for he consumes his own wastes after the custom of idiots. Music alone issues outward from him, yet it has no substance or form, its semblance of form arises from the ever-present breath that pervades creation and bears it along. In itself the music is only number, upon number, and so cannot be truly said to proceed from Azathoth, for how can a number possess motion through space? Despite the indifference of their god, Members of the cult of Azathoth emulate his music and dance accompaniment, spinning and revolving on the wind they create with their own turning motions. Pipes pressed to their lips and their eyes rolled heavenward. The dance is their ecstasy, the music itself their prayer. In this way they seek unity with the center of all things. They wear as a pledge of their faith the seal of the idiot god over their hearts. Men ask in the marketplace in idle talk why the world was created, there is no answer, for the world was made without thought by an idiot to whom good and evil are the same. He hungers and feeds yet is never satiated. He pipes and hears but does not see. Of sorrow he knows nothing, neither has he felt happiness. 
He pipes with patience, and the music of his flute rolls outward in trilling waves that rise and fall upon the breath of the cosmos, and the notes fulfill their patterns and move inexorably toward the last day, when the fury of his half-brother shall be expressed, and there will come silence. The wise men of the Tigris, learned in the ways of the stars, placed Azathoth in the sphere of soul, because both are at the center of things. The god at the center of creation, and the sun at the center of the wandering bodies of the heavens. As the sun is hot and bright, so is the palace of Azathoth located in a place of great heat, and his face is blinding in its radiance that darkly shimmers. They gave to him the number square of the sun, having six rows and six columns, each making the sum of one hundred and eleven, and the sum of all is six hundred and sixty-six. This is the number of the beast of the Christians, and wisely was it chosen, for the beast shall usher in the last of days. The Magi make the seal of the god that is formed on this square into a charm upon a plate of gold, and wear it to attract money and substance, and to ensure health of the body. On the reasoning that all things come into being from the music of Azathoth, therefore his square must bring forth substantial virtues such as vitality of the flesh and the increase of wealth. Their reasoning is flawed, for as the god creates, so he destroys. Nyalat Hotep, corresponding with the sphere of Mercury. Of all the lords of the old ones, only Nyalathotep appears wholly in the likeness of a man. The shapes of the old ones are not fixed, but express their nature through a harmony between form and intention, yet it is possible for them to change their appearance within the bounds of this accord. And Nyalathotep chooses to come to his worshippers as a man of greater than average height who is in all respects human save one, that he has no face but only a blackness where a face should be seen. As the face of Azathoth is darkly bright and radiates outward, so the face of Nyarlathotep, his half-brother, is a void that draws inward both heat and light and never releases them. He is the eater of souls. Why he comes in the shape of a man is not known, but it may be to better have dealings with humankind, since he is reputed to enjoy the company of men when they drink wine and gamble, and the bodies of women with whom he lies in lust, remarked one observer. He speaks as a man speaks, but his voice has the coldness that lies between the stars, and few wish to hear his sardonic laughter, for then there will be death. Men are to him as playthings to a child, to be taken up for a time, then abruptly cast away and trodden into the earth. Even so, he teaches great mysteries to those who worship him, but always leading to evil works, for he delights in wickedness. Those who dwell in the empty space and seek knowledge in the tombs and caverns of the earth, sometimes see Nial at Hotep walking alone across the sands, as though lost in thought. Wrapped from brow to toe in a swirling black cloak with a hood, a call upon his face, rings glittering upon the fingers of his hands like so many stars, stated another. It is dangerous to approach him at these times. His dealings with men are at his choosing, and his patience is brief. With a single word can he burn the flesh from the bone so that the skeleton of an unwary man remains standing a moment before it collapses with a dry clatter at his feet. Yet he is capricious, and it may suit his whim to teach a secret to the audacious fool who accosts him. When he appears it is oftentimes with the piping of a flute, and the reason is that he has been with his half-brother Azathoth at the center of the universe. And through the open gateway that Yog sothoth has not yet sealed can for a time be heard the trilling of thin notes that set the hairs on the neck upright, elaborated the speaker. He is not so inconvenienced in his coming to our world as the other old ones, though why this should be so remains unknown. Perhaps it is the human shape he wears that partly shields him from the poison of the stars. Whatever the reason, he serves the old ones as their messenger among men. It is he who keeps the true gods of our race hostage in Kadath, in the cold waste of the south, and who deprives them of their minds and makes them dance to the flute of Azathoth. A necromancer newly cast forth into the great wastes came upon a tall man robed all in black who stood upon the crest of a dune beneath the stars, head cocked to the side as though listening to music, though no sound broke the silence of the night save the wind. His face was shadowed in the depths of his hood and his back was turned. Emboldened by his disregard, the desert dweller crept up the slope of the dune with knife drawn. 
his intent to slit the throat of the stranger and steal his cloak and boots. When he raised the knife, he found that he could not move. The stranger turned and gazed at him, and he screamed, for there was no face in the hood, only two glittering stars. For a dozen heartbeats the stars pierced his soul and flayed it open. The stranger turned without a word and walked away, and the dweller fell to his knees and wept over the loss of such exquisite emptiness. Nyalat Hotep is a trickster who may temporarily put on any form to beguile the wits of those to whom he appears. He delights in lies and misdirection, and for amusement will corrupt the thoughts, so that it is unwise to trust overmuch in his teachings, for sometimes they are sound and precious, but other times they are fatal if pursued. Wisest of the old ones with the exception of Yig, who is wisest of all, he knows the law of magic not merely of this world, but of many others. He is called by his worshippers the myriad-formed messenger, but by his detractors he is known as the chaos that crawls. Neither dare speak his name without dire need, for to name him aloud on the tongue is to invoke him, even though he is not seen. For he comes to those who call him by name, cloaked in shadow so that he is unknown, and studies them to learn their purpose. Then he may aid, curse, or slay, according to his humor because he is the wisest of the old ones, and a trickster, and the messenger and herald of these gods. The Magi of the Tigris joined him with the sphere of Mercury, quickest of the planets and messenger of the Olympian gods, he who is most learned in speech, and in the art of writing, interjected another. They used as a charm the seal of the god inscribed on a plate of electrum formed upon the number square of Mercury, having eight rows and eight columns, each with a sum of two hundred and sixty and the total number of this square is 2,080. It was their belief that the square, when worn over the heart, would avert the wrath of Nyalat Hotep, as a token having power over his coming and going, but it would be unwise to place over much faith in the efficacy of this charm. Shubnigarath Corresponding with the sphere of Venus Viewer's discretion is advised. Of the fecundity of the earth, there is no end. Her womb breeds monsters unglimpsed by those who dwell under the sun, and her twisting entrails crawl with things white and blind. These are the children of Shubni Garath, who is called the goat with one thousand young, by those who dare not speak her name. She is of the gender of a woman, for what except the womb brings forth fleshy life upon the ground, or beneath it, those who worship her with images most often depict her with the head of a goat. This is not her true visage, which is bestial but unlike any beast known to men. Yet it may be that the image of the goat was chosen as appropriate, due to the ruttiness of this animal, which is proverbial. Her statues are black and made of stone, and are often of human size, though some are smaller for the convenience of carrying in those lands where her worship is severely punished. They show the goddess standing upright four horns bristling from her hairy head, her mouth snarling with savage teeth like those of a wolf. Her arms and hands are those of a woman, but her legs and feet are those of a goat. She is ever naked, her torso covered with innumerable round breasts to suckle her countless progeny. But that which is most shocking to those who strive to suppress her cult is the gaping and exposed state of her genitals. By this, her worshippers express that Shubnigarath is the womb of the night from which all creatures of nightmare issue. In the ancient time, great Cthulhu lay with her and bred upon her the armies that overthrew the elder things, for the manner of her bringing forth is not one after the way of women, nor even a score after the way of mice, but myriads of myriads of children issue from her womb, which never closes. It has been ages since she last lay with her cousin, and most of his children are dead or have sought their dwellings deep beneath the sea and under the surface of the ground. For they hate the light of the sun, and, being of the same substance as the old ones, cannot easily endure the noxious rays of the stars that presently keep Cthulhu imprisoned at Rilia. When the stars are right, and darkness covers the earth, they will issue forth from their deep pits and lakes, and from the ocean, and fulfill the will of the old ones as they did in the beginning of things. Her rites are wild ecstasies of debauchery, during which brother lies with sister, mother with son, father with daughter, 
infants conceived in this unlawful way are sacrificed to the prolific goat, and their blood consumed in wine to produce intoxication and visions, so also are the bodies boiled in great pots, and their flesh consumed by the revelers, who recognize no restraint of law and practice any outrage against religion. They are accustomed to meet in caverns during the night hours, both for greater security against detection, and also because the deep places are the wombs of the world, sacred to shub -Niggurath. With red and blue and yellow pigments they paint their faces and bodies, for they worship naked after the way of the goddess. Upon their backs they paint her seal. The men dance with their virile members inflamed and erect, and the woman dances obscenely, opening and closing their bent knees to expose their genitals, and shaking their heads and their breasts, while screaming invocation of the goddess to the beat of drums and the drone of flutes. Around blazing fires they dance, the flames rising higher than their elevated hands, and the men gash their arms with blades and spatter the blood on the thighs of the women to make them more fertile. The women scream these words in the tongue of the old ones. Eya, Shubnigorath, Eya, Eya. The voices that echo in the caverns resemble the yelping of dogs, for there is nothing human in the sound. When the worshippers begin to couple, it is the women who mount on top of the men, in honor of the supremacy of the goddess, as the womb of creation. The theological books of the Hebrews make veiled allusion to this practice in their fables concerning Lilith, who was the wife of Adam before Eve, and who had union with him on top rather than beneath. Babylonians had similar stories of a demoness of lust that bore strange children from the seed she stole away from sleeping men in the dark of night. In truth, Lilith is no other than Shubnigarath, even though the scribes of the Hebrews dared not write her name. She visits the men who seek union with her in their dreams, but only if their lust is great. When she comes to the bed, she presses upon the chest of her lover and takes her pleasure on top of his sleeping body, and from his ecstasy she gives birth to monsters of a lesser kind, those that inhabit the desert places of the world and lie in wait to murder travellers beneath the moon. From the seed of the old ones her womb gives rise to great abominations, but from the seed of men it yields lesser evils. In dreams, she cloaks her form so that men do not withdraw from her, but when she visits her worshippers, she comes as she truly appears, and they welcome gladly her bestial kisses, for she makes their virility unending. The worship of Shubnigarath is greatest in the lands of Lebanon and around the salt inland sea, but she is also adored with orgy and sacrifice along the upper tributaries of the Nile, and on the western shore of the Red Sea and between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. Yet these are only the chief centers of her cult, for her worship spans this world in lands both known and uncharted, carried far and wide by her roving cult, as it moves from place to place in its caravans. It has been the cause of much misery and countless mysterious deaths, since her worshippers must have human flesh for their sacrifices during her highest rites, and where infants cannot be procured they use, the flesh of travelers, for the disappearance of a traveller causes less inquiry than the vanishing of a local dweller. The Magi gave to Shubnigarath the sphere of Venus as her natural harmony, because Venus is a goddess noted for her concupiscence, who brings fertility to beasts and crops. However, the life-giving power of Venus is wholesome, whereas that of the prolific goat is verminous and foul. As a charm to ward her off during sleep, they engrave upon a plate of copper the seal of the goddess formed on the number square of Venus, which has seven rows and seven columns, each of which sums 175, and the total of all the numbers of the square is 1,225. Some scholars profess the opposite belief, that the seal of the prolific goat attracts the goddess to the bed, and both opinions are true, depending on how the seal is employed for if it is laid with the engraving downward against the chest, it attracts, but with the engraving upward to the sky, it repels. A young man of Yemen who wished to punish a rival in the love of a woman, bribed a servant of the rival to bury the seal of this goddess beneath his master's sleeping place with the engraving down. In the span of a single cycle of the moon, the rival was so troubled by nightly visits of Shubnigarath in his dreams that his flesh wasted away, and he went mad. The woman gave her love to the remaining suitor, 
who enjoyed it for a term until the revolving wheel of fortune stole her from his embrace. Dagon, corresponding with the sphere of Mercury. It is the assertion of our cartographers that the seas of the world exceed in their expanse the lands, so it is little to be wondered that another of the lords of the old ones should prefer the depths of the ocean for a dwelling. Mighty Cthulhu has his home in Ri Laie in the sea that lies eastward, and far to the south off the shores of distant Cathay, but Dagon is reputed to inhabit a deep chasm on the seafloor, the location of which is unknown. It is believed that the race he created in his image, who dwell beneath the waves and serve his designs, have their greatest number in the western ocean beyond the pillars of Hercules. For this reason some have speculated that Dagon abides in the west, but wiser commentators offer no opinion on this matter. Among men he is worshipped most faithfully by the descendants of the Canaanites, who in times past built idols to him that enraged the Hebrews, as is recorded in the sacred texts of that people, noted one observer. The Deep Ones, as his sea-dwelling brood are called, are friendly to men if treated with courtesy, and aided the Canaanites in capturing in their nets rich harvests of fish, greatly to the increase of the wealth of that nation and to the envy of neighboring peoples. In compact with the Deep Ones, the Canaanites gave as a pledge of trust their daughters in marriage, and among the cults of Dagon this practice continues. Continued another, the Deep Ones, admire the beauty of women and delight to lie with them. In return for this pleasure, they adorn their brides with rich and cunningly fashioned jewellery for they are greater in skill than any other beings of our world in the making of ornaments of precious metals and jewels. In the northlands of Hyperborea he is known as Kraken, and in the books of the Hebrews as Leviathan, interjected a third. He sleeps and dreams, not imprisoned in a tomb as is Cthulhu, for the leagues of water above his head protect him from the poison of the stars, but lying in the deepest part of the chasm that serves as his house beneath the mud that covers him. At times he wakes and travels the seafloor to visit his children and certain holy places on islands or off promontories where members of his human cult make offerings, which they cast into the waves of the sea while chanting his name. Vast is his body, covered with great silver scales. His hands are as those of a man but longer a finger and webbed between, added another. The same is true of his feet the slender and webbed toes of which resemble a great tail when he puts his legs together and swims with powerful strokes. This has caused some commentators to write in error that he has no legs. His head is similar in shape to the head of a dolphin and joins to his body without a neck. In his domed forehead is set a single eye greater in size than the round shield of a warrior, and being devoid of a lid it never shuts, even when he sleeps. When emerging into the shallows, he walks upright and bent forward with his long arms dragging in the water. His voice is deeper than the largest bell, and may be heard for many leagues when he speaks from out his mouth, which is broad and set low on his head. Some artists have drawn this god in the form of a woman, naked to the waist, with the tail of a fish. This is a vulgar error born of ignorance, yet it is true that like the fish of the sea, the sexual member of Dagon is concealed within his body and is reputed to only emerge when the god has copulations with Shub Niggurath, explained another. In appearance he is neither male nor female, but a blending of both. Those who have seen him with their own eyes attest that his body is translucent, so that the light of the moon passes through it as through a cloudy crystal, for he ventures into the air only in the light of the moon. Never beneath the heat of the sun, the reason for the watery appearance of his body is that it is composed of no ordinary flesh, but of substance carried from beyond the sphere of the fixed stars. Subject neither to age nor decay, it is deathless. Those engendered on the daughters of men who are given in marriage to the deep ones share in part this longevity, being greater in years than one of unmixed race. But shorter of life than the pure spawn of Dagon, continued another. When they are born, they resemble a human infant but as they age they acquire the fishy attributes of their fathers, until at length they are more at home in the sea than on the land. They abhor the dryness of the air, and always make their dwellings near the ocean where the wind is damp and salty. By their watery eyes you may know them, and by the moist pallor of their faces. 
As they grow older, their mouths broaden and their voices become deep, and when they speak a gurgling is heard in their throats. The cults of Dagon adore as sacred a black pillar, which they say is the source of his power. Each cult keeps in addition to his statue a smaller simulacra of this pillar, the original of which rests beneath the sea at the chasm where he sleeps, added another. Its sides are covered in hieroglyphs of a language that is not to be encountered elsewhere in our world, for it is specific to the Deep Ones. Those who have seen the replicas of the great undersea pillar have drawn out a number of its symbols at great danger to themselves, for it is considered the most terrible violation or blasphemy by the worshippers of Dagon, who hunt down and without mercy put a sword to the violators. The Magi of the Tigris Valley associate Dagon with the sphere of the moon, upon reflection that the moon controls the tides and is of a watery composition, and that Dagon is never seen to walk except beneath the lunar rays, and is bounded by the place where the tide reaches its lowest ebb, as by a barrier that cannot be crossed. Also the moon is silver, resembling the color of his scales, and moonlight is translucent, as is his flesh, concluded another. They use as a charm to Dagon engraved upon a plate of silver the seal of the god formed on the number square of the moon, composed of nine rows and nine columns, each of which sums 369, and the total sum of the square is 3,321. The square is supposed to ensure good catches of fish and happy fortune when travelling by water, though in truth these things are dependent upon the sufferance of the deep ones who are capricious in their favours. Yig, corresponding with the sphere of Saturn. From the beginning, man has feared the serpent, but why this lowly creature, that crawls upon its belly and nests beneath the earth, should be an object of dread and wonder has been forgotten. Though the causes are echoed in our dreams and in the myths of our ancestors. In the sacred book concerning the creation, it is the serpent who teaches wisdom to Eve, and for its reward, it is written that humankind and serpentkind are forever after to become deadly enemies. And so it came to pass. The serpent has ever been regarded as the wisest of living things, and deathless, for it renews itself by the shedding of its skin. How shall it be that the wisest of beings is the most reviled and feared? Know that the wisdom of the serpent is the wisdom of Yig, most ancient of the lords of the old ones. In the dimness of time, Yig made an approach to the ancestors of man and spoke silently in their minds, offering to teach our race the secret of eternal life in return for loyalty and worship. But the prophets feared the knowledge of the serpent and counseled that the covenant with Yig be rejected by the people, lest they be tainted in their souls with the poison of the viper and the ASP. For this reason, all snakes are killed at first sight, even though they be harmless and offer no inconvenience. Yet not all the people followed the prophets. Some made secret pacts with the Lord of the Serpents, and they are known by their adoration of his favoured creature. The serpent is not native to our world, but was carried here from beyond the stars before the awakening of our race, as a thing of amusement and diversion by Yig, and as a reminder of the world where he arose. For the shape of the serpent is the shape of this god, his true shape. For he goes sometimes in the form of a man with the head of a snake, but this is only the shape he puts on for his dealings with men. In his true shape he undulates upon his belly and has no limbs. Dambala he is called by the black-skinned barbarians dwelling on the coast of Africa, and by the Egyptians he is known as Apep. He is remembered in the myths of the Greeks as the cosmic serpent that encircles the world, who is without beginning or end, for he is deathless. Many are the places of his worship. He is strong in the temples of the eastern lands, where the basilisk is especially revered and protected as the monarch of serpents. For it consumes lesser snakes as prey, and stands upright upon its tail to the height of a man. And its gaze has the power of causing entrancement in the minds of those who look into its eyes, there is no power of human will strong enough to resist its seduction. Only by the music of the flute can it be controlled, and when it hears this sound, it begins to dance and loses its power to strike so long as the music plays. Learn here in a deep mystery, known to few, 
that the music of the flute is the song of Azathoth, the blind idiot god, he who is the center of creation, whose song made the myriad of worlds, the flute of Azathoth all created things obey, be they ever so unwilling to do him homage, for in their hearts they despise this lord for his mindlessness. Stronger still is Yig in the temples of the unknown lands that lie beyond the western ocean, where he is worshipped as a god in the form of a winged serpent. The wings express the flight of Yig, who has the power to bear himself through the airy zone of our world as though carried on the wings of a bird. These lands are known to but a few tribes that dwell in the distant northland of Hyperborea, where it is perpetual twilight, for these tribes are great seafarers and worshippers of Yig. Their very ships are shaped with the heads of dragons, and their swords are patterned after the scales of serpents. The dragon that flies in its serpentine shape expresses yet another form of this old one. A wise man disregards the teaching of the prophets and will not slay a serpent, not even if struck and envenomed, for to kill serpents is to invite the displeasure of this god, who uses the serpent for his eyes in all parts of our world. Wherever a serpent crawls and watches, there watches Yig, even though it be the least of snakes scarce larger than a worm. All are his children, for all hold in their nature the essence of this god, who is great with their multitude, but diminished when they are slain. It is whispered that were all serpents to be killed, so Yig would pass out of our world, but whether there is truth in this saying only the event will show, and that shall never be witnessed by men. For the serpent is aeons more ancient than our race, and will endure aeons after our fall to dust. Those who worship Yig summon him to their rites by means of his seal coupled with the following invocation, which they chant in unison while swaying their bodies to the sounds of flutes. The constellation sacred to Yig is that known as Draco, and his sect believes that the god dwells there and gazes down upon the world. He is called into the body of a priestess who lies naked upon the sand, writhing her limbs and hissing through her lips. Her thighs anointed with blood, and her eyes rolled back into her head, so that only the whites may be seen. Approach, deathless one. Heed the summons of the flute of Azathoth your creator, the song of which none of his blood may deny. Descend slithering down the rays of the stars from the coils of the dragon. Great serpent old of years and wise in wisdom, at the beginning of time you gave the gift of knowledge to the race of man. Through the embrace of a woman during the forbidden days of her cycle, enter again this female vessel, whose thighs are streaked with blood, and insert your teachings into her mind, that your faithful servants may profit from her instruction. Render sweet the fruits of her womb. Empower her with your mighty arts to defend us against our enemies, and against those who would defame your memory. E ETA Emin Tula Aga Aeth Yig Flango Utha The Magi likened Yig to the sphere of Saturn for the reason that Yig is the most ancient of the old ones, and Saturn the most ancient of the planets, the serpent is coldest of beasts, and this wandering body inhabits the most distant reaches of the heavens, where the warmth of the sun is least, Yig is wisest of the old ones, and Saturn is wise in secrets and mysteries, serpents hunt their prey in the main at night, and Saturn inhabits the darkened depths of space, serpents are slow and sleepy when chilled and Saturn is the slowest of the wandering bodies. They gave to Yig the number square of Saturn, as a sign and expression of his nature. It is a square of numbers having three rows and three columns, each with three cells that sum fifteen, and a total of nine cells that sum forty-five. From this square, the seal of Yig is extracted, for the letters of the Hebrew script, most ancient among the writings still used by mankind, are also numbers and the letters in the name of the god may be traced upon the square. It is believed by the Magi that this seal, made into a talisman in lead and worn close to the heart, offers protection against the biting of serpents and attracts the benevolence of Yig, or at the least averts possession by the god. For it is the custom of Yig to enter the bodies of his worshippers as a spirit, and his presence is known when they fall on their bellies and writhe on the ground in imitation of the way of all serpents and hiss with their lips but cease to speak in words of their own tongue. For it is singular with Yig alone among the lords of the old ones that he never speaks, but instructs his possessed worshippers with images in their minds. In this condition, 
they forget the use of their hands, and if they must pick up a thing they do so with their mouths, for all of the power of a serpent is in its jaws. Wherefore the word yiga signifies in the tongue of the old ones big of mouth. The power of yig to become present to human sight and to work his will in the world is greatest at two days of each cycle of the moon. When the course of the moon and the course of the sun intersect, these conjunctions are known to the astrologers as the Caput Draconis and Cauda Draconis, or in the common tongue as the head and tail of the dragon. These conjunctions are sacred to Yog sothoth the keeper of the gates between worlds. On these days of each month, the worshippers of Yig rejoice and celebrate his rites, but the enemies of the serpent god conceal themselves and dread in terror his approach. For his coming brings either exaltation or punishment, and no man has seen him who has not been moved either to happiness or sorrow. This is the end of the story. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Please subscribe and ring the notification bell so you'll be the first to know when we release new content. If you want to support us, consider joining our channel membership. You will get instant early access to more than 100 stories before their release. This is the only way to support our channel.